Does dollar cost averaging do better than lump sum investing when the stock market is overvalued? That's the question we're going to tackle in today's video. Hey everybody, my name is Rob Berger. This is the Financial Freedom Show where we talk about investing, retirement, and financial freedom. If those topics are of interest to you, I encourage you to subscribe to the channel. I also send out a newsletter every Sunday morning. You can sign up for that with the link below this video. So I get a lot of email from folks. They've got some money to invest. Do I put it all in at once, lump sum investing, or do I spread it out over some period of time, uh, dollar cost averaging? And uh, more recently, folks have started to refine that question and say, look, Rob, I, I hear that lump sum investing does better uh, more, more times than dollar cost averaging. But what, when, what about when the stock market is overvalued, at least as compared to historical averages, when the, say the price to earnings ratio is significantly higher uh, th than the, the average, which is very much the case today, as we'll see, does dollar cost averaging do better in those environments? Well, that's what we're gonna cover. Now, this issue is actually very important even if you don't have some money sitting in cash ready to invest. Maybe you're already fully invested, believe it or not, this question can still be very relevant to you. And as we'll see, it can also be relevant to the question for retirees, how much can I safely spend each year? It can actually affect the 4% rule as you'll see at the end of this video. So let's dive right in. The starting point is this, study after study shows if we ignore valuations for a moment and just look at a large period of time, that lump sum investing outperforms dollar cost averaging about two thirds of the time. And I'll show you one, one of many studies. This is from Vanguard and I'll, I'll leave links to everything I'm showing you below the video. This is actually from 2012, but they did an analysis and what they did, they said, okay, we're gonna compare just putting all the money in right away versus dollar cost averaging. And, and they looked at several scenarios where they dollar cost averaged over six months, 12 months, 18 months, two years, two and a half years, and three years, and then looked at the outcomes at the end of a 10 year period. And as you can see, we'll scroll down here. There's a table, here it is. Uh, here's the United States. They also looked at, as you'll see, United Kingdom and Australia data. But in the United States, uh, lump sum investing outperformed about two thirds of the time. That's true if we were dealing with a 100% equity portfolio, 60-40 portfolio here, or even 100% bonds. Pretty much consistently, lump sum won two thirds of the time. That was pretty much consistent in the United Kingdom. Uh, in Australia, it, it wasn't quite uh, to that point, but, but still close. And, and in any event, lump sum investing uh, outperformed even in Australia. Uh, more than dollar cost averaging. Now, one thing to point out there is that they constructed their tests in a very specific way, as I described. There are other papers that, that look at different uh, uh, lengths for dollar cost averaging, and they look at the outcomes. Uh, they don't, some of them don't wait 10 years to look at the results. Some may wait longer, as, as we'll actually see in a minute. But, but I will tell you that for all of the studies I've seen, it still comes out to pretty much two thirds of the time lump sum investing wins out. And I think that makes sense conceptually because most of the time asset values go up. Of course, we know they don't always go up and that accounts for the one third of the time when dollar cost averaging wins out. Now, as we wanna sort of begin to introduce now this question of valuation, and for that, I wanna look at another paper. It's actually an article from the, the blog of Dollars and Data. Uh, Nick does a, a fantastic job, uh, very good content on this uh, site. And uh, he did look at valuation, but before we get to that, he, he, like Vanguard, just said, look, without regard to valuation, which does better? He looked at actually a two-year uh, time period, so dollar cost averaging over two years. And um, looking at the S&P 500, here it is, he found, again, that most of the time, lump sum investing wins out. When this line is above the 0% marker, that means dollar cost averaging won out. And um, you can see here, it won out over two periods during the time period he looked at. The first is the tech, the, the tech stock bubble, right? So this is early 2000s, where as we know, the market crashed. And so during that period, yeah, dollar cost averaging did do better. And then the financial crisis there in 07, 08 time period, 09. And yeah, there again, dollar cost averaging uh, out, outperformed. But other than that, uh, lump sum uh, investing was the way to go. So again, roughly two thirds of the time. Now, what was interesting about this article 
before we get to the question of valuation was that he looked at other asset classes, like things like Bitcoin and gold and emerging markets and so on. And he found that generally, regardless of the asset class, lump sum investing outperformed dollar cost averaging. Now, as we start to move to valuation and, and, and think about the, the valuation issue, one of the things Nick talked about in this article uh, was the question of risk. Because lump sum investing is riskier than dollar cost averaging if we define risk as uh, more volatile. And that kind of makes sense, right? Because with dollar cost averaging, you're keeping more of your money in cash uh, until it, you, know, you move it into the market. So you've got more in cash with dollar cost averaging, averaging than you do lump sum investing. So sure enough, it's riskier. But he did something interesting. He said, well, let's compare this. Let's compare a lump sum investment, but we'll put that in a 60-40 portfolio, so 40% bonds, so not nearly as risky as 100% stocks. But we'll compare that to dollar cost averaging into 100% stocks. And what he found, I'll show you the chart. It's further down here. Let's see if I can get to it. Yeah, here it is. Monthly returns for a 24-month dollar cost averaging into S&P 500 versus lump sum into a 60-40 portfolio. And what he found was that the lump sum still won out, not by as much, of course, but it still won out uh, uh, with lower risk. So I thought that was a very interesting finding. Obviously, I'll link to this article. You can check that out uh, yourself. And that gets us to the question of valuation. So in Nick's article, he did look at valuations. His overall view was uh, I think that still lump sum investing uh, typically does win out, except when the CAPE ratio, the, the, this is a cyclically adjusted PE ratio, they take sort of 10 years of earnings, adjust them for inflation and use that to calculate the PE. And let me actually show you that now. Again, I'll link to this below the video, but here is sort of a historical view of this. It's called sometimes called the Schiller PE because Schiller came up with it. It's currently at 29.24. What Nick found was that dollar cost averaging does win out when the CAPE ratio is greater than 30. Now, you'll notice today it's at 29.24. Now, one of the things that Nick's, Nick, Nick mentioned was it's so, it's so rarely above 30. It just hasn't happened. The date, there aren't, there's not much data. To, to look at because historically it hasn't been above 30. In fact, if we go back to the chart, we can see maybe it touched 30 during the 1929 market crash or right before the crash. But other than that, it hadn't been above 30 except in the tech bubble. Now, of course, we know that more recently it's been above 30. But if we were looking at uh, dollar cost averaging versus lump sum investing over two year periods, lump sum investing would have likely won out during most of these time periods, because other than in 2022, uh, the markets have done extremely well over the last number of years. But still, he concluded that dollar cost averaging does outperform lump sum investing when the stock markets aren't just overvalued, but I would say are extremely overvalued. Now, a, re a, a, a viewer recently sent me another study that attempted to do the same thing. And I want to show you that and talk about it uh, because it's important. Uh, this is from John Luskin. I know John, he's very active in the Boglehead community. He was on a, he and I were on a panel together at the last Boglehead conference. He does great work. Uh, and uh, so he wrote this article, a study in 2017, and it's exactly what we're after. Dollar cost averaging using the CAPE ratio. And he went through a, 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 a lot of analysis. I'm going to just boil it down for you. But again, you can read this paper on, on your own. Uh, but what he did was he looked at dollar cost averaging. Are you ready for this? Over a 15 year period. Now, let me just stop there for a moment. I think as a practical matter, with, with the exception possibly of retirees, and I'll come back to that, it would probably be very difficult for most people to actually stick to a dollar cost averaging plan over a 15 year period. But that's what he looked at. Now, he didn't give the data for shorter periods, but he did indicate in the paper that, that dollar cost averaging doesn't outperform uh, more times than not when you're looking at shorter periods like five or 10 years. He didn't mention even shorter periods, think six, 12, or maybe 24 months, which I think 
is what most people have in mind, at least when they email me and ask about dollar cost averaging. But you have to keep in mind, in John's paper, he looked at uh, lump sum investing versus dollar cost averaging over a 15 year period. Now, let's uh, jump to the results. And they are right here. Uh, and I'll, there are a couple of things to keep in mind here. The first is what he found was again, remember it's a 15 year period, that when the, the, the uh, Schiller PE, the CAPE, right, cyclically adjusted PE, is 18.6 or higher over a 15 year period, uh, dollar cost averaging beats uh, lump sum investing. So if we, if we take this study to heart and we're prepared to dollar cost average over a, a 15 year period, his paper says it's not a guarantee but that given the current Schiller PE of, of 29 uh, and using historical data, we are probably more likely to do better dollar cost averaging uh, than lump sum investing. Again, no guarantees, but probably. Now, the other interesting number though, and this is consistent with uh, Nick's article of dollars and data is that John found that when the PE was greater, in his case, it was 31, not 30, but when the, when the the, the Schiller PE was 31 or higher, and you can actually see it right here in this chart, whoops, this row right here, chance of dollar cost average outperformance, 100%. And here was the average outperformance, uh, uh, half a percent. When it gets to above 36, the chance of outperformance, of course, still 100%, the outperformance, 2%. Now, the interesting thing I found about his study, though, is look at this row right here. When the PE, the KP ratio was between 26 and 31, it never outperformed. A dollar cost averaging never outperformed. And we can actually see it in this chart. It's this box right here. The blue dots are the performance. If it's below this 0% line, lump sum investing wins out. Uh, you can see it does win out most of the time. But as valuations get higher, and that's the horizontal measure here, particularly as we saw 31 or higher, right? Dollar cost averaging always outperforms, but it's it's odd to me that in this box here, when it's between roughly 25 and 30, dollar cost averaging never outperforms. You see, when it's between 20 and 25, sometimes it does outperform, and that would generally be when there's a big market crash. Why it doesn't outperform at least some of the time when the PE is between 25 and 30, I don't know. And it's not something that John discussed uh, in the paper. I think it's an interesting open question. Still, the conclusion both from Nick and John was that when uh, the PE is extremely high, arguably like it is now, uh, that dollar cost averaging has a good chance of outperforming. Now, I do want to mention one other thing before we get to retirees. The, P, the Schiller PE is 29.24. Uh, there, there have been folks that say, you know, that's not really accurate because a number of reasons, but one of them would be the, the corporate tax rate changes uh, in 2017, which I think is an, a, a valid point. I would actually adjust the Schiller PE down a bit because of changes in tax laws. But still, while it's not 30 or 31, even if adjustments are made, it is uh, still pretty rich based on historical standards. So there you go. That's Nick and John's studies. I think it's it's interesting. Frankly, though, for me, it's probably not enough for me to make massive changes or, or frankly, any changes to my approach. I'm a big fan of lump sum investing. It's how I've always done it. And I stay in the market, keep to my asset allocation plan, regardless of valuations. But as I promised, this issue can be relevant even if you're already fully invested in the market and particularly for retirees. And I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about why. First of all, uh, let's imagine two individuals. They both have IRAs. One is fully invested in whatever their asset allocation is. Let's say 70-30 or 80-20. The other person has just rolled over a 401k into their IRA and it's sitting in cash and, and they're now struggling with this, you know, lump sum versus dollar cost averaging question. I would argue that in theory, both of those scenarios could struggle with that question because if you think about it, the person who's already fully invested, remember this is an IRA, no tax consequences from say selling your stocks as long as you don't pull the money out of the account. They could, if they wanted to, sell all of their stocks, go completely to cash and in that situation, 
both of these hypothetical IRA owners are in the exact same situation. And if they wanted to, then dollar cost average over some period of time, whether it's sort of something like two years, which Nick evaluated, or I guess as long as 15 years, uh, which John evaluated. But the point is, uh, even for those that are fully invested, they can ask that question, should I consider valuation in my asset allocation? There are a lot of papers on this very issue, valuation-based asset allocation, sometimes called tactical asset allocation. Uh, Wade Fowle, we're going to look at one of his articles on a different topic in just a minute. He has done research on this. Michael Kitsis has done research on this. So there are a lot of papers, and I will summarize them by saying generally, when the markets get very, very, very rich, there is an argument for valuation-based asset allocation. And uh, the odds go up that if you do it right, whatever that might mean, you might get some outperformance. I can tell you that for me, I think there are behavioral sort of financial issues. I think it's very hard to stick with those sorts of plans. And for me, I don't change my asset allocation based on valuation. But I want to just sort of let you know it's out there. It's a, a lot of research on it. And I will do another video maybe focused specifically on that. But that brings me to the last uh, sort of uh, topic for today's video, and that is for retirees, can we use that tactical or valuation-based uh, asset allocation to increase the safe withdrawal rate we can use in retirement? And it turns out there have been studies on this, including one by uh, Dr. Wade Fowle. Let's take a quick look at it now. Here is uh, the article, and actually I'll just show you, the, go to the top for a second. Again, I'll link to it below, but here it is. Withdrawal rates, saving rates, and valuation-based asset allocation. So uh, what Dr. Fowle did was he compared a 50-50 portfolio. Let me get back down to the chart for you. It's right here. Uh, he considered uh, con compared a 50-50 asset allocation with what he called a Graham and Dodd 25-50-75 valuation-based asset allocation. And let me explain that briefly. He said for that 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 uh, Graham and Dodd, who who are you know well known value investors, um, Warren Buffett talks a lot about them. Uh, so what he said was, look, when when stock prices are normal, which he would he would define generally between a PE a Schiller PE of ten to twenty one, in that range, 50 50 uh, asset allocation. If it falls below ten, you're going to bump up the stocks to seventy five percent and reduce the bonds to 20, uh, 25. And if it goes above 21, like it is now, you would do the opposite. You would increase bonds, decrease stocks. So that was the idea behind this 25, 50, 75% valuation-based asset allocation. And as you can see from the chart, the blue line is when you've just got a fixed 50, 50 asset allocation. And he's measuring the, the initial safe withdrawal rates, assuming a 30-year retirement, and that we're going to adjust the, the payouts each year for inflation. And you can see that the Graham and Dodd valuation-based asset allocation, which is the red line, is uh, generally higher than a fixed 50-50 asset allocation. Now, it's not always higher. In these early years here, they, they overlap. They're pretty much the same. But uh, in, in years as you move into uh, the 1900s and certainly through uh, the Great uh, Depression here, and then over here, this is sort of the bad inflation periods of the 70s and bad stock market uh, uh, returns, that's when this valuation-based asset allocation approach uh, can outperform. And what he found when you looked specifically at the numbers was that a 50-50 allocation fixed gets you roughly, as we know, about 4%. His number came out to 3.93. But when you use this valuation-based asset allocation that, that I just described, it actually bumps the initial safe withdrawal rate to 4.58. That's a pretty significant jump. Now, having said all of that, I think there are some practical considerations because if you're going to make these changes, first of all, the money's probably got to be in a retirement account. If you're, you're using, to some extent, taxable money, the tax consequences of, of changing your asset allocation like that probably are going to erase the benefits. So you've always got to keep taxes in mind. And then there's just a behavioral uh, aspect. When the PE goes, say, below uh, 10 or 11, really bad things are happening. And as a retiree, are you really going to be able to take more of your money and put 75% into stocks? That was what Dr. Fowle tested. Uh, so I guess a question only you can ask. Now, I will finish with one other thought. 
there is the idea of rising glide path in retirement. So rather than reducing the amount you have in stocks as you age, once you get to retirement, you actually start with more fixed income and you increase as time goes by uh, the amount you have uh, in, in equities. This is something, again, that Dr. Wade Fowl and Michael Kitsis have done a lot of research on. As you would expect, sometimes a rising equity glide path, that's just the fancy word for increasing your exposure to stocks in retirement, sometimes a rising equity glide path actually does outperform, but of course, it doesn't always. I suspect we could do a, an evaluation-based analysis similar to what we've looked at when we look at dollar cost averaging versus lump sum investing and find that a rising equity glide path probably has a better chance of outperforming when stocks are overvalued like they are now, at least based on an historical uh, average. I think there's more work to be done there and I am gonna do some other videos in the future that dive into that issue in more detail, but there you go. So at the end of the day, yeah, valuation does matter. It may not matter as much as you think and a lot of it depends over what period of time you look at and over what period of time you would actually dollar cost average. For me, I'm still a lump sum investor, but of course you have to make the best decisions you can for yourself. Hopefully this research has been helpful. Again, I'll link to all of it below the video. Well, there you go. Hope you have a great day. And until next time, remember the best thing money can buy is financial freedom.